Oh, well, good morning. So good to have the Friendship Club here with us. Thank you guys for singing, and thanks for all your leaders working in that ministry. That's a delight, and so good to have maybe some of you are friends and family of the Friendship Club members as well. So welcome. We haven't had a chance to meet yet. I'm John, one of the pastors here at North Park, and uh, this is uh, part four, our sermon four of a seven-part series that we're doing on the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm going to speak this week and next week, and then Phil will come back and wrap it up. But uh, question that I have for you today is, are you a daring, adventurous person, or are you a scaredy cat like me? How many of you guys are roller coaster people? All right. I am until I get on one, <laughs> and then I'm not. Have you guys ever heard of the slingshot? My wife, uh, Brenda, spent a couple days uh, down in Florida with her sister, and they're doing some stuff in the Orlando area, and she sent me a picture of uh, this ride at one of the places. This isn't it, but it was one like this. The slingshot. Doesn't look all that adventurous, does it? But here's where they are once you get up in the air. So it's two poles, basically, and it's a slingshot that slings you through the air, all right? Who wants to go on that? All right, there's the adventurous people. All right, you guys ever been on a zip line? That is so cool. I'd like to do that one. That one doesn't seem so bad. So here's a zip line, though. Uh, this one was unique. I thought it was over the water on a coast somewhere down in Florida, I think. Zip line, just go right across. I know there's one at Lake Ann. How many of you ladies went on that, the ladies retreat? Any guys done that? Yeah. So these are things that, like, for some people, they just love it. They can't wait to get there. And for other people, it's something that's, like, really scary, right? One last one. How many of you guys have ever been rappelling? Yeah, a few of you. Um, I used to go on adventure uh, wilderness trips in the summer. We'd go out to Colorado, and we would do some whitewater rafting, and then we'd do some rock climbing, but then we would do rappelling. And if you've ever rappelled, and you have a, a fear of doing stuff that you're not quite sure about, rappelling can be very hard. I've sat out there with other people, kids, for an hour, trying to convince them to take that step off of the cliff. So in the morning, though, the leaders, the guides, they go out there, they secure the ropes, they stake it right down into the rock. They have webs of uh, harnesses that go over top of rocks to hold the rope. And then there's a leader who will wear a harness around their waist, and the rope will go through their little uh, harness that they have there, and it's got a device on it that can lock it in case they need to. And then there's the participants, and we put our harness on, and then we hook up to that, and if you're up at the top of the cliff, sometimes you can't see the bottom. It kind of sticks out. And so they tell you, trust the rope. And you're supposed to back yourself out. And you're supposed to sit in a position where your legs are parallel with the ground. So to get to that point, you've got to just lean back and slowly walk over the cliff that you can't see. And if you fight it, it's very hard to do. So like I said, I've been up there before for hours with somebody trying to convince them to take that step. Having done it myself and not really being an outdoor person like that, it took me a while. But if you don't trust and you don't surrender to the rope and trust it, even when you go over, then you're basically hanging by a rope. <laughs> but if you'll trust it and you just kind of sit down and trust that rope and trust that They've anchored it properly, trust that those harnesses will hold on the rocks, and that there's somebody up there who's got the rope, that you're not going to fall. Then you can just relax and sit with your legs parallel to the ground, and then you probably have seen that before. What do you do next? You push off, and you let go of the rope a little bit, and then you slide a little bit farther down. And so if you are not able to surrender yourself and trust the rope, You'll never get to the bottom where you're trying to go. Nor will you experience something that very few people in life will experience. Once you get the hang of it, and once it works, all right, sorry, my uh, notes went away. Once it works, something you get to experience that no one else gets to work. As we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer, I've been thinking that prayer is a lot like that. What if prayer is really only possible or only works the way it's supposed to when we're willing to surrender and trust God? What if it's really less about us getting something from God and it's really more about God giving something to us? And what if the key is surrendering ourselves, trusting the rope, trusting God to provide for us? So we've been looking at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, 
Jesus is addressing some religious activities, and he's saying, when you do fasting and giving and praying, when you do that for other people, that's your reward. They know that you're doing it. But if you'll do those things in private, and you do it only for God, he sees you there, and he'll reward you. And in Luke's account, one of the disciples goes to Jesus and says, hey, would you teach us how to pray? And I just wonder if we aren't just like some of those first century followers, that we can learn a lot from Jesus as he teaches us how to pray. And so he says in Matthew chapter 6, this then is how you should pray. And we've been looking at this model prayer that he's given us. First, we looked at the person. Who is it that we pray to? He said, start with our Father in heaven. We've looked at the pronouns, how that when we pray, we never actually pray alone. We pray always in fellowship with other believers because we have the same father and we have the same father as Jesus. So we can come near to him, but he's just not any father. He is the father in heaven, sovereign king of the universe. And that changes what we pray for. It changes our priorities. And so we start with hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This weekend, I've been listening to a song by Matthew West and it's called His Story, My Story, His Glory. And then his testimony is, now the story of me is a story of grace, fingerprints of mercy on every page. No more ashamed of the path I took. You, God, set me free to be an open book. If even my scars are part of your plan, take all of my heart, Lord, here I am. My only cause till you call me home is knowing you more and making you Known My story, your glory. My pain, your purpose. My mess, your message. In all things, I know you're working. One life, one mission, one reason why I'm living. All for you, not for me. My story, your glory. And then would you read this bridge to the song with me? All of me, all for you. Let all I say and all I do Point to the one who changed my life and let me speak the legacy I leave behind. Jesus says when you start your prayer, you pray to your Father in heaven. And that shapes your priorities. Our prayers are, God, what do you want? Here's my life. I surrender. I trust the rope. I give myself to you. And then in verse 11, we finally get to the place where we start. Usually when we think about prayer... We think about it as us coming to tell God what we need. And that is important. And so he does get to that in verse 11, where he talks about personal needs. And so he says, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So these personal needs, these three are what we're gonna look at next. And we could think about it with three words that all start with the letter P. Provision, we're gonna talk about that today. We had to pray for pardon, that'll be next week, and then Phil will wrap it up looking at verse 13 as we look at protection. So today, we're looking at give us today our daily bread. It's a simple request, very straightforward. We're to ask God to give us what we need. We're to pray for provision. Now, we've looked at the pronouns, so I remind you that even here, when it comes to personal needs, us and our, constant reminders that This is something we pray for ourselves, we pray for each other, but we are always praying in fellowship with our God. And then notice the first word, give. Give us today our daily bread. This is something that God wants to do for us. He wants to give us gifts. He wants to give us something. And he has daily gifts for us. And Jesus says to ask God for these gifts. James chapter one, James will put it this way, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down from, to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Anything good in our life is a gift that comes from God. And so God says, ask me for provision to meet all your needs, your physical needs, your spiritual needs, your emotional needs, all of them. But here in this verse, Jesus focuses specifically on the physical, and so I wanna to talk to you about that this morning. Why bread? got here different loaves of bread, right? That almost seems like a punishment for us, isn't it? Here, you can only have bread. 
We talk about people being put in jail and they get what? Bread and water. Almost seems like a punishment. Now, we like bread. We can use it on a sandwich. We might like it with a, a good Italian meal. We got some sauce we want to dip it in. So it's like a complimentary thing. So why bread? Why does he say, pray God, give us our daily bread? Well, in that day, and for people who didn't have a lot, bread is like a staple food. It's easy to make, can be made at home. And to the first century listener, this would have sounded like winning the lottery. I'm gonna have enough bread, enough to eat every day. If I'm praying this prayer in the morning, I might be praying, God, today, before this day is over, please give me enough food for myself and my family. If I'm praying it at night, I'm thinking about tomorrow. God, tomorrow, would you please provide an opportunity for me to be able to have enough food, enough bread to feed my family? Collect, or excuse me, when the Jewish audience would have heard this, give me my daily bread, they most likely would have thought back to an experience of their ancestors. You might remember if you're familiar with the Bible or if not, in the Old Testament, we read about Israel who was on their way to the promised land and God had to take them through lots of different experiences as they doubted whether they could trust God or not. One of those experiences was as they traveled, a very large group, how would they have enough food to eat? And God said, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you quail, some birds, and some stuff called manna. What is it? It was an unknown, unknown food. It was a bread-type substance. And he said, I'm gonna provide that for you every day. I'm just gonna give it to you. It'll be there, but you can only collect enough for one day. And if you collect more than that, it's gonna go bad. So every day, you have to get up in the morning and go collect your food. And I'll give you enough for one day, except on the day before the Sabbath, you can collect it for two days because I want you to rest on the Sabbath. Now, why did God do that? Why did God only say, I'm gonna give you enough food, enough bread for one day? Are we getting the right message from God? When God takes us through experiences, sometimes we might miss the point. We might misunderstand the message. There's an urban legend that talks about the uh, uh, FFA and how they would test windshields for an airplane. You guys might have heard of that. They, they created a gun that launches a dead chicken at a plane's windshield at approximately the speed of, that a plane flies. They're trying to see that if the windshields are strong enough that if they hit a bird while they're flying that the windshield won't crack. The theory is that if they can shoot this chicken using this gun, a chicken gun, and the windshield survives, then it'll survive hitting a bird out in the field. And uh, so they ran these tests, and uh, the story is that the British were very interested in this and wanted to test a windshield on a brand new speedy locomotive that they're developing. And so they borrowed the FFA's chicken launcher, loaded the chicken, and fired. And the ballistic chicken shattered the windshield, broke the engineer's chair, embedded itself in the back wall of the engine's cab, the British were stunned, and they asked the FFA to recheck the test to see if they'd done everything correctly. And the FFA reviewed the test thoroughly and had one recommendation. Use a thawed chicken. <laughs> Use a thawed chicken. It's important to get the whole message, right? To understand the point of what we're doing. The Old Testament gives us the advantage of seeing Israel go through different experiences and they're recorded so that we can learn from them. But so often, later when someone writes about that experience, they'll explain it to make sure we get the point. And in Deuteronomy chapter eight, as the people are about to go into this promised land that God is taking them to, they're reviewing some of the things that God has told them and some of their experiences. And Moses says there in that, book Deuteronomy, he, God, fed you with manna in the wilderness, a food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and test you for your own good. He did all this so you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. So he said, I'm going to give you enough for each day so that you don't begin to think that what you're accomplishing and what you have isn't because of your own strength and energy. And the point that Jesus is making when he asked us to ask God for our daily bread is that we're not to forget God and we are to be dependent 
on him. Both when we're lacking, when we have a need, we're dependent on God. But also when our situation changes, when we have all that we need, or God blesses us with much more than we need. We're no less dependent on God then than when we're wondering where our next meal will come from. In verse 11 of that same chapter, Moses says, but that is the time to be careful. What's time? When you are having everything that you need and more. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands, regulations, and decrees that I'm giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, next verse, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. So what he's saying there is, God has been providing for you day by day by day by day. He's trying to teach you to be dependent on him because you're going to this promised land and there you're gonna be wealthy. You're gonna have fine homes. You're gonna have huge herds. You're gonna have all the food that you could want. In another place, he said, even other nations are gonna come to you to get food. And he said, in that time, be careful. Don't begin to think that you have plenty because of yourself. Don't forget me but be dependent on me. God is the ultimate provider, and Jesus says to ask for you what you need and maybe just ask him for enough. Maybe we should ask God for everything we need and then stop and be happy that we have everything we need. And this is difficult in a culture of excess like ours. Maybe today your prayer is for daily food. And you pray, today, Lord, give me my daily bread. If that's where you're at today and you need help, uh, today as we take the Lord's Supper, we'll give money to something we call the Benevolent Fund, and that's available for people who have needs like that. Come and talk to us, and we can help you with that. There are kids in our area that don't have enough food. We've got a couple ministries that are related to that. Uh, This past week, some people from my life group, we went to an organization called Kids Food Basket. And it was amazing to hear some of the numbers. 60 different schools, and since July 1st of 2023, they've handed out 818,000 meals that are either lunches or dinners for kids who don't have enough food. They told us it was 10,000 meals a day that are going out. And so they have volunteers that come in, and we went in and packed lunches and put them in paper bags and got those ready to be part of the order for the next day. Uh, We work with a ministry called Hand to Hand Ministries. And that's a ministry that was started by a mom when she lost her job, and she couldn't take care of her own kids, and they got some free meals at school, but on the weekends they didn't have food. And so that's a ministry that provides food for kids, and they take a backpack full of uh, food home for the weekend. They're in 280 schools. They serve as 12,000 students, and 125 of those are in our community. And our church directly works with Oakfield, uh, West Oakfield uh, Elementary School, where there's 29 meals that we deliver each week so the kids can take those home. So they have enough food on the weekend. It's not just families. It could be elderly people too on a limited income. And especially when the weather is not good, unable to get out. And so you have ministries like Meals on Wheels. So maybe that is your prayer. That is a very real prayer. God, please provide food for me. Give me enough bread that I have enough to eat today so that I can make it through the day. Maybe that would be your prayer if it weren't for credit cards. Maybe that is your prayer because you have too many credit cards and the debt has become unmanageable and now you've struggled to pay for even your basic needs. For most of us, though, it's been a long time since we prayed in a day, God, I don't know what I'm going to eat today. Would you please provide a meal for me? We try to remember to say thank you for the meal that we do have. Or maybe even as we eat, we also think that there's people who maybe don't have a meal. So God, would you please help them as well? 
But let me ask you just to evaluate a little bit your own life and our culture. Because it can be hard to hear a prayer like this that talks about bread and just having enough food to eat when we usually have plenty. How is that working out for most people, living in a culture that has so much excess? If having more than enough is so great, then we should have a country filled with people who are grateful and happy and content. Certainly that's how we should be if we're part of the church, right? Compared to most of the world, we are all rich. And we know that because we have refrigerators and cupboards that are filled. We have two and three cars and garages to put them in. We have closets that are full of clothes. We have smartphones and cable or streaming services. We get to go on vacations. Our credit card bill is more than we thought it would be at the end of the month because we have opportunity to spend. We have Amazon trucks that basically park in our neighborhoods daily, right? And we so easily buy into the culture's message that we are primarily consumers. This morning, I just want to tell you, God desires to meet all of your needs. But he has desires to give you something else as well. He wants you to have the freedom from worry and anxiety. And he wants you to have freedom from chasing more. Or from trying to find your identity in what you have or what you own. So what do you need today? Whatever your need is, physical, emotional, spiritual. Jesus says, go to your heavenly father and ask him for it. But I also encourage you to ask God for enough, maybe. Not more than enough, but enough. And stop there and be happy with it. Declare your dependence on him today. Surrender. Step over that cliff and trust the rope. Trust that your heavenly father loves you and wants to give you good gifts. He wants you to give the daily bread that you need for today. But I also know that Jesus is teaching us here that prayer is less about getting something from God and it's more about God gifting something to us. So how should we feel as Americans here in the West that we're so blessed and we have all of this excess and we have so much? It's easy to feel guilty about that. How should we handle that? Well, in the New Testament, we can look in a book called 1 Timothy. Paul was a traveling missionary and he's writing to Timothy who's a young pastor. And he addresses this issue of having a lot, he would say to rich people. I know we may not consider ourselves rich, all of us, but compared to the rest of the world, all of us are rich. So if we could go to the verse in 1 Timothy, he says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Do you guys catch that? Godliness, a relationship with God where you can see him making you more like him, that in and of itself is wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we, can take, we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So, if we have enough food and clothing, let us be what? Content. What is content? Don't want anything else? Don't need anything else. I have everything that I need. He says if you have food and clothing. Now, in our modern day culture, we need a few more things to really survive than just food and clothing. But the basic necessities, if we have that, he says, be content. Now that sounds like very strange talk for us today. But why does he say that? Well, continuing on, in verse nine, people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped. This is where I worry for us in our American culture. The desire to be rich is the dream. It is the goal. And here, Paul is telling Timothy, tell your people, that's a trap. Being rich isn't a trap, but desiring and craving to be rich is a trap. They're trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. It's a money trap. You see this picture here, maybe that will stick with you, that you can be reminded. So we get these messages or we have these desires thinking that money will solve all of our problems or give us some type of security. It's not wrong to have money and to have things. 
And we'll look at here in just a second how we should think about that. But the desire to pursue that in neglect of God and not be content with what he gives us is a trap. Look at verse 10. For the love of money, again, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. We all know people who, in pursuing a job, pursuing a career, pursuing a bigger house, a car, an affluent lifestyle, that have gotten to the point where they say, you know, I don't really need God anymore. I'm a self-made person. I need to work harder and get more. God isn't a part of my life. So we need to make a, a mental note here, a spiritual note. This message of our culture of living with all of this excess is a trap. It doesn't provide what we think that it will provide. I don't listen to much rap music, but we're probably familiar in our culture with a guy named 50 Cent, who his theme, his life story, his song, his movie, get rich or die trying. I heard him talk about that the other day. He basically was saying, I was gonna do it my way. I was gonna pursue being rich or I was gonna die trying. That was his goal. And Paul is telling this young pastor, that's a trap. When you crave money and crave being rich, that's a trap. And so Paul says to Timothy in verse 17, here's what you need to do. Teach your people this. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and what? Not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Rich people have problems too. Money doesn't solve the issue of disease and sickness. It doesn't solve the issues of broken relationships. It doesn't secure a relationship with God. And that's in this life. But it is so unreliable when this life is over. When you cross over from this life into eternity, your money does nothing. It's so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So I do want us to notice that. Why does God give us these things that we have in this life? For our enjoyment. So we don't need to feel guilty about that. God has blessed us with many good things. We need to enjoy them, but we also need to be grateful. Next verse. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. So we don't need to feel guilty that God has blessed us with things, but we need to be grateful. Acknowledge that they come from God, and then we need to be generous people. When someone has a need, we should be ready and willing to step in and let them use our stuff, give them our stuff, help with money, whatever is necessary, because it's not ours. God has given it to us to steward, to use for his good. So we enjoy it, but we're generous people. We do good with it, and we help meet other people's needs. And then he says, by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. You see the difference in this and craving and loving money and desiring to be rich, trying to find your security and your status and what you have? So much different. There's freedom in acknowledging that what I have, whether it's little or a lot, comes from God. He's not negating that we need to work, gives us other principles that we're to work to take care of ourselves and our families. Other people will help. But the truth is, there is so much in this life that we can't control. Just because somebody does well and is successful doesn't mean that they don't need God. And when somebody struggles and doesn't have a lot doesn't mean that God isn't taking care of them. Relationship with God is about our heart and our dependence on him, whether we have a little or a lot. So living in this country that we do with so much excess all around us, we have genuine needs. Ask God to meet those needs. But maybe, just maybe, say, God, give me enough, and then stop there. And if he gives us more, then we're grateful 
for what he's given us, but we're generous people and we do good with it. We don't hold on to that as something that we're trusting in for our security. There's a lady in our church, she's in her 60s. She's not able to come a lot, but she always wants to make sure that one of our deacons or myself can stop by and get her offerings. She said, Pastor John, I wanna give those offerings, they belong to God. And she doesn't have much, she's on a limited income. But she wants to be, she wants to demonstrate her love for God and be a generous person. Recently there was somebody in my new extended family that needed a second car. Their old one broke and they didn't know if they had enough money to get one and uh, a mutual friend had a van that they were gonna sell for several thousand dollars. But they heard that they needed it and instead of going to them and saying, hey, we have a van for sale, would you guys be able to afford this? They just drove it over to one of our family gatherings and gave them the key. It's God's van. I don't need it anymore. You can have it. That's the kind of generous spirit that God is talking about. There's some things sometimes that go on here at the church that you guys aren't aware of. As we take our Lord's Supper, we're gonna ask you to give to our benevolent offering. And there's always a very healthy amount in that benevolent offering. We're able to do a lot of things with it. But sometimes people in the church, God puts it on their heart to meet a need and they're not quite sure what the need is yet. Here in December, we had two anonymous uh, gifts that were given. People came to myself or Phil and said, hey, here's what we have. And we wanna meet somebody's need in the church and bless them. And there was a family that was struggling financially because of some other things that were going on and they weren't able to work as much as they needed to and things were really bad. And we were able to go to them and say, hey, somebody in the church just wants to bless someone that's in your position. Here's a $5,000 check. And they were so overwhelmed and they're so thankful for God's provision in their life. There was another family that it was Christmas time and together they decided God's been really good to us this year instead of spending so much on gifts for each other, let's see if we can give to someone else. And the same thing, we were able to connect them with someone and be the go-between and give them a gift simply because the family said, you know what, we have enough. Let's take our extra and give it to somebody else. That's the kind of spirit that God is talking about here. So let me ask you a question. Do you have a plan to use your money to bless other people, to be the answer to their prayer? Have you defined what is enough in your life? How much is enough? Or every time that you get more money or you get an uh, increase in your income, are you always just going to spend it on more things? Or is there an amount you can say, this is enough. Anything that God blesses with me over this, I'm gonna invest it in other people. I'm gonna try to find needs that I can meet. I'm gonna support ministries. I'm gonna try to do something with this money that will help God's kingdom. Could you imagine the difference that would make in our lives, the life of our church? And can you imagine what kind of testimony that would be to the world around us who doesn't yet know Jesus? It would communicate that there's a deeper reality. Even when we pray for God's provision in our life to meet our physical needs, there's more to just this physical life. In that same passage in Deuteronomy, there's some words that we might be familiar with if we have read about Jesus' temptation, and this is what he was quoting. Back in Deuteronomy chapter eight, Moses says, yes, he, God, humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did this to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. People don't live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So when we can demonstrate this kind of dependence on God and we're not looking to physical things to provide us with security and status, we're demonstrating that there's more to life. There's a deeper reality because prayer is less about us getting something from God. It is more about God gifting something to us. There's a greater gift given to meet our spiritual need. 
His word, the Bible, in which he reveals to us who he is and what his will is and how we can be reconciled to a God that we've sinned against. In John chapter six, Jesus is having an interesting discussion with some Jewish people who don't accept that he's the Messiah. And he did a miracle that probably most of you are familiar with. He took five loaves of bread and two fishes and he fed thousands. Then the day ended, he goes across the lake. The same people show up, they're looking for Jesus again. And they're like, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Hey, remember what God did back there? We want you to do the same thing. Give us more of that food. Next verse. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. Who did? My father did that. And now he offers you the bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Here's what they said, verse 34. Got the next verse there. Sir, they said, give us that bread. When? Every day. You see, Jesus has shifted gears and now he's talking about spiritual life. They're still wanting that bread. Hey, the way that our ancestors got manna every day, we want you to do that for us. Do that miracle again. Give us some more bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. And in verse 47, we drop down. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors, they ate that manna every day and they died physically. But anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. Jesus is saying there's a greater reality than just this bread that you want from me physically. I want to talk to you about your spiritual life. And I am God's answer to our spiritual death. That death comes because we disobey God. We're unable to keep his standards. We rebel and go our own way. And the payment for that is death. It entered the world with Adam and Eve and it continues until now. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever believes in me, that's where security is. Forgiveness of sins, that's how you come to know the Father. And that's why Jesus says to pray, our Father in heaven. Today, give us our daily bread. And we only pray that because Jesus is the bread of life. And so if you don't know Jesus today, if you've never put your faith in him and repented of your sins, you still have that spiritual hunger in you. You might be trying to fill it with material things or relationships or Whatever it is, you're trying to fill it and find some meaning and purpose and security. And Jesus is saying, that's me. I'm the bread of life. I'm the only one who can take away that hunger. And so this morning, we're going to transition over to the Lord's Supper. And so I'm going to ask the people to take their places and move a few things around here. In John chapter 6, Jesus continues the discussion with them. And he's trying to get them to see that what's required is to accept him as the promised Messiah, the one who can save them. And he says, in order to get that, here's what you have to do. You need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now to us, that just sounds like kind of silly or gross, right? For them, they're trying to figure out why the Messiah would say something like that, but on the face of it, it sounds very strange as well. Eat your flesh and drink your blood. What is Jesus talking about there? Jesus, again, is talking about a spiritual reality and using material things. He's no longer, uh, he's no closer to saying, eat my flesh and actually drink my blood than he is a literal loaf of bread. But what he's saying is, if you want eternal life, if you want a relationship with God, if you want security for this life and the next, it's only found in me. And we know that because later, at the very first communion, a meal, as he talks about the bread and he talks about the wine, he says, do this in remembrance of me. These are symbols. And that wafer 
that we'll take here, that represents that Jesus is the bread of life broken for us. He gave his life so that we could have eternal life. He took our place. And as we drink that cup, it's a reminder of the blood that was shed, a life for a life, a perfect life. We have earned punishment for sin. He never sinned once. He came as God's only son, entered into the human race, lived a perfect life, but then he gave up that life took our punishment so that we could have life, so that we wouldn't have to have that void and that hunger any longer. And so, if you're a Christian, we encourage you, invite you to participate in the Lord's Supper. If you're not a follower of Christ, this has no special grace or meaning, we would encourage you to think about giving your life to Jesus, taking in the bread of life so that you could have eternal life. But we do have some warnings in scripture for us as Christians not to do this flippantly. We're speaking about the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. So if you have some sin in your life that's unconfessed or a relationship with someone that's not what it should be, this is a time for us to be reminded to make those things right. Confess that sin to God. Commit to going and talking to your brother or sister. And so we're gonna pass out the elements and as they do, there'll be the bread and the cup together. And there'll be some uh, gluten-free ones in the middle if you uh, need that. And during that time that it's being passed out, just take some time to reflect. Think about your heavenly father, how it is that we came to be part of his family. And just think about what a wonderful God he is in the gifts that he gives us. Thank him, especially for the bread of life, his son and our savior, Jesus Christ.